Right guys, welcome down to this week's Finch Friday. So many questions to get through. Honestly, I'm so grateful for you guys interacting like this. There's literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. But what I'll do is I'll pick the best ones, answer as many as I can. This will not be a Nike orientated Finch Friday. That has already been done on Tech Tuesday and that video is on my channel. So if you do want to engage around Nike dropping equipment, hardware, balls and bags, please go on to that video. So let's go. Question from Charlie M. Sears. What is the best way to practice my swing with a small practice space? No ball flight, just a mat and a net. To be honest, you don't even need a mat and a net. If you have a golf club and you have room to swing, you can dial down and really nail down into some slow motion practice golf swings. It is such a worthwhile thing to engage in. It's a difficult thing to engage in because it does become quite tiring after a while, just continually slowing your swing down. But if you have space, slow motion swings, go through all the motions that you want to, can be very, very beneficial. I do have a video out there already. I may do an updated version of a slow motion swing video, but just really breaking your swing down, taking it piece by piece and feeling every section of it can be so useful. Don't do that to hit balls. Question from Paul Gillum3, when should players be working on shaping shots? I'm relatively new and my coach says I should start as soon as possible, but others are saying I should wait until my strike is more consistent. Um, I think there's maybe a split in between practice and play here. If you're practicing on the driving range, you can start to shape shots using only a half swing. There's some great drills out there, um, and again, I've got videos out there on shaping shots where you only need to use a half swing, but understanding path and face relationship will give you a better understanding of the golf swing as a whole. That switches over, however, when you get onto the golf course, because if you're not striking it consistently or somewhere near the center of the club most often than not, then that shot shaping will be affected. If you strike it out of the toe or the heel, especially when you look at the driver, that will affect shot shape in itself. So striking the ball consistently is important, but there should be nothing to stop you practicing that because it will give you so much more of a feeling and so much more of a, an idea of where your path in your swing face is within your swing. Question from Cathal underscore 1056. Is it good to go to the driving range and practice the day before a big competition or should you just relax and rest for the competition the next day? Um, what I would do is I would recommend doing something which Nick Faldo used to do. Um, Faldo is someone who splits opinion in the way he goes about things, but I think this is a fantastic example of something he did very well. When he was preparing for a tournament, so the week before and during the week, what he did is he wrote down in a diary, practice, practice diary, he wrote down everything he did within the week before, the week during the competition, everything. And what he managed to do over a period of time is start to figure out if he did this on a certain day or ate that on a certain day or practiced this on a certain day, he was much more able to get into a consistent pattern which made him perform better. So he figured out what his best routines were in the weeks before leading up to a tournament and during the tournament as well. Very simple idea, it takes dedication to do, which not a lot of people do, especially weekend golfers, you know, might not have the time to contribute towards this. But it's a great way of understanding how you best prepare for a tournament. In most general terms, there is nothing wrong with you going to practice the day before a tournament and practicing hard, there's nothing wrong with that. The key, the key, especially if you're working on swing changes, is by the time you get to the first tee, trusting the work that you've done, switching off from swing thoughts, and just playing the game. That is the hardest thing to do. If you are someone who, again, this is how you find out, if you are someone who plays better whilst relaxing the day before a big tournament, the only way you're gonna find that out is by practicing relaxing the day before a tournament. Everything within golf can be worked on, and that includes preparation. Question from All and Off one two three. Hey Pete, happy to see you back on the course. Thank you very much. I was curious what the main differences are between forged and cast iron clubs. Thanks for your time, no worries. Um, the main difference is feel, uh, especially when you strike forged clubs compared to cast clubs. The feeling is just so much better off a forged club, in my opinion. It feels softer. It feels more responsive. You can get cast clubs such as the new iBlades from Ping that just brought out that feel really good, that feel very solid and soft, 
but you can still tell that there's a difference there when you strike them out the middle. The advantages that people have, that companies have, when they're making cast clubs rather than forged clubs is the fact that cast clubs allow more manoeuvrability. You can precision cast in a way where you can introduce a lot more um, materials, you can introduce a lot more complex design than if you're just forging, especially if you're just forging from a single piece of steel. It's often the case that although a cast club may not have the same type of feel as a forge club, cast clubs are often better for most people because of the different amount of technologies that can be put into them. Um, there are some differences such as the PSI tools that I have, they are forged and they've managed to put the face, face slots within the club head which they brought down from the RSI range and you know what? It does seem to make a difference, but I know the fact that with the bigger headed clubs of the PSI and with those face slots, they seem to make more of a difference in the bigger cast clubs. So better feeling on forged irons, they're more workable as well from a custom fitting standpoint, you can bend them more. A cast construction, slightly firmer feel, slightly harder feel, but more technology and slightly harder to work uh, when custom fitting. They can't be bent as upright and as flat and twisted as much. Uh, they snap a lot more easily. But if you're gonna get custom fit to begin with, you won't have to worry about that. Question here from, and this is something that a lot of people can relate to. Jfish0031. Hey Pete, I have days where my swing is working and then the next day it won't, so I have to change my swing again. Any suggestions for a consistent swing? Um, more than likely, this has nothing to do with your swing. You've just done it, you just perfectly spelled it out there yourself. Some days I have swings when my days when my swing is working and then the next day it won't so I have to change my swing again. You don't have to change your swing again. I would always recommend people having lessons, working on technique, trying to improve their swing overall. The fact is golf is a hard game and something out by just a few degrees from day to day can have a massive effect on ball flight. It is hard, it is very hard to hit a few bad shots and then go you know what I am not going to change I'm going to stick with my swing, I'm going to clear my mind, and I'm just going to try and play my game. As soon as things start going wrong, people are tempted to try and change things straight away to try and get an instant improvement. And that can often lead to big problems, especially if you're trying to change it halfway through a round. The best option is, if you are struggling with something within your game and it is a consistent problem, go see a pro, work on your technique. If you hit different shots from day to day, you're probably thinking about things differently. The mind and how you're focusing on your targets and how you're thinking about your swing will have a massive impact on what is happening within your technique. If you can find a way to free your mind, clear your mind when you're playing, that is going to be a much better way to go. And then refocus on your swing after the round on a range and within lessons. Question from Osain28, will anyone beat Jack Nicholas's tally of 18 majors in this century. Um, you can never say never. You can never say never because there is always going to be someone coming along who has the ability to play incredible golf. You would look at Tiger and say he obviously still has the best chance. He's not that many away now, but of course he's got his injury issues and will he ever return to the player that he was? It's very, very doubtful. Tiger definitely had the best chance. There's no doubt about it because he was playing in his peak years, I think everyone would agree, even Nicholas would agree, he was playing the best golf of anyone ever. It was truly, truly incredible. I feel very lucky to have been born in a time and to have been able to watch Tiger Wood as my role model when I was growing up. Because from a swing point of view, a game point of view, he was so much better than everyone else. And what he also did is he managed to lift the whole level of the game. And what people have the problem with now if they're coming up and they're trying to emulate a record like Nicholas's, everyone, else games, everyone else's game has lifted now. Because of the Tiger effect, because of the way he approached it, everyone is better. So for someone to suddenly dominate the game um, like Tiger did and like Nicholas did, I think that's going to be really hard. But never, ever say never. The fact is with sport, and one of the very best things about sport, is there is always someone trying and there is always someone willing to come along and stake their claim as the best ever. It happens again and again and again and again. And that is an exciting thing for us who are watching the game as spectators. It's, yeah, there's always gonna be someone who can come along and prove that they are better. 
Who will it be? I don't know. Question here from Cameron underscore McLaren. How did Jim Fury get going and keep up with the birdies when he shot his 58 of the Travelers? He said it himself. He managed to keep out of his own way. He managed to get out of his own way and just allow his golf to flow. He managed to get into the zone. Um, as far as mental training around the golf course, I am going to be doing a lot more videos on this going forward. Um, if there are any aspects of the mental game that you want me to really, really focus on, please comment in the box below. I'm compiling a little bit of a list at the moment and trying to get a video program in order. It is something which is very, very important and not a lot of people focus enough time on. So yes, it's something I will be looking at, but he just managed to get out of his own way. I've almost got to read this question out. This is from Pete underscore Finch underscore fan. Thanks very much. That's the first one I've seen of those. Um, what got you into golf and if you do, why do you love the game? Um, yeah, I certainly, certainly do love the game. There's no doubt about that. Um, what got me into golf? Just my dad. He played and he encouraged me to try and to try and play as much as possible. He was, it's interesting with my dad because he was a very good footballer. He was signed on at Preston North End who my local team, I still support them. Um, got a really, really bad injury to his knee. Basically, all his cartilage is gone from his, I think both his knees now. Um, but he always encouraged me, I'd, I'd say very early on since I started playing football when I was young, to try and play golf as almost a bit of an alternative because he saw football as a much harder sport to get recognised in and to play at a professional level because football is very much about opinions. So if you have a scout to come watch you and you have a fantastic game, that scout might not just like something about you and therefore he won't recommend you to get trials. And other players he could recommend and you get overlooked or vice versa. And my dad was very keen on golf with the fact that the score you shoot is what you shoot. And it doesn't matter how you play the game. It doesn't matter how you look while you're doing it. It doesn't really matter about anything. All that matters is the score on the board. So he introduced me to that concept of it and it's very hard to disagree with that. And from about, I think I was 13 when I decided to play as much golf as I did football. And then by the time I got to 15, I just gave football up and decided golf was the way to go. Jump over to Facebook here, it's Scott Wright. I can, can constantly hook the ball to the right. I'm guessing you're a left hander, Scott. A stiff back and dodgy knees leave me with a kind of half swing. Never used to have any problems, but this just keeps me off the course. What my swing back? Very simply, anyone who's struggling with big differences in ball flight, so right or left, whatever it might be, club face. Club face, club face, club face. Even with a half swing, you can get the ball around the golf course. But if that club face for you is pointing off to the right hand side too much in relation to your path, that's where you're going to get the hook from. Focus on ways to change club face. So we'll end on this question. I think this is a very interesting one. Peter Michael Book Blitchfield. Do you feel that with all the tech for teaching, video, launch monitors, 3D capture, pressure plates, etc., will be the end of Furyk, Daly and Watson? What the technology is pushing all against a more, is technology pushing a more generic optimized swing like the one Rick Shields is currently implementing? Absolutely. 100% not. Absolutely 100% not. The thing is with launch monitors especially, what launch monitors do especially, is they focus on what is happening at the point of impact. So what is happening with path, with plane, with face position, with strike and all the rest of it. Now the fact is, when you look at Bubba's swing, when you look at his launch data for drivers, it's not that excessive in any ways. It's a really good set of numbers. Same when you look at Rory's, when you look at Furyx launch data as well, they're producing really good numbers at the point of impact. Now what you can do with launch monitors, you can look at the, the ball data and say, well, you're hitting a hook for example, and your club face is pointing too much off to the left hand side for a right hander. So what you then do is you say, okay, well that club face is pointing off to the left hand side. All the other numbers are good. What's the one thing to change? So you look at club face and say, okay, club face is in a strongly gripped position or it's just closing throughout the swing. So then you change club face and you get straight to ball flies. You've not looked at the swing technique. You've not tried to turn that player into an identical model of a Adam Scott, for example. Although it'd be great if everyone did swing like him. It'd be lovely. Um, so what you've done is you've looked at the data and you've just tweaked something and the rest of the swing you've left alone. 
Now, all these great players, most of them now do use launch monitors. And video analysis, if you're just trying to compare that player and change that player into a perfect swinger of the golf club, then yes, that can get more of an identicate, identicate way of thinking about things and changing people into this perfect technical model. But the proof is in the pudding. You look at the PGA Tour, the likes of Bubbers, the likes of Furyx, these players keep on coming. It's not like they're being wiped out from the game. There are a lot of good technical golfers out there, but everyone still swings it differently. You know, we are as different as snowflakes, as I heard recently, and everyone's swing is as different as a snowflake as well. Everyone has individual tendencies within their swing, which is different than the counterparts. But when it comes down to the ball data, when it comes down to impact, those numbers don't lie. And it's a great way to coach people. Right, guys, thank you so, so much for watching. I'm going to have to end it there. There's so many more questions I could have got through, but this video is already running over long enough, and I've got to go to the traffic centre. I've got to go shopping. A um, little insight into my day. So please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Follow me on the social media platforms as well, linked in the description below. It is there where I post these questions. So thank you again for watching, and we'll see you soon. Stay tuned for next week. Uh, the Ian Wright videos are coming next week, and they're awesome. Really good.